Okay, so we've talked about computers and how it represents information. We've talked about computers and how they compute. But now, how do humans talk to computers? And first of all, we as humans, how do we think? Well, we think in terms of pictures. We think in terms of language, text, words. We think musically at times, or we can think mathematically. And wrapped up in all of this are our emotions. And in fact, we don't even really understand very well at this point how humans think. Now, we've been talking about computers. How do computers think? Well, it's very simple. They think in terms of ones and zeros. So that there's a huge gap between the way humans think and the way computers think. So how do people talk to computers? How do they give them instructions? How do they tell them what to do? Well, that's where computer languages come into play. So computer languages allow us to bridge this gap between the way we think and express ourselves and what computers can understand. So there are literally thousands of different computer languages. Some of the more widely known ones are G Java, C, Python, Fortran, Basic, C++, Lisp, Ruby, and so on. And all of these languages have different strengths and weaknesses. Python is a wonderful general purpose language that we'll be using in this class. And note that I have the megaphone sort of pointing from the human toward the computer. And that's because we really give instructions to the computer and then we tell it how to talk back to us. So our computer language is mostly designed for allowing us to express ourselves in a way that's kind of natural to us to get to a point where the computer can understand it in terms of ones and zeros. Okay, so we have these computer languages, but why not design computers to understand natural languages, the languages that humans normally use, like English? Well, the problem with natural languages, they're often ambiguous. And let me give you an example of that. So let's consider this sentence, Alice and Betty had on the same dress. Well, what does that mean? So here's Alice. She shows up at a dance. She has on this beautiful dress that she's very proud of. And then later on to the same dance, Betty shows up and she has on the same dress. She maybe purchased it at the same store. Alice and Betty see each other and they're just mortified. They're very embarrassed that they have on the same dress. Okay, so that's what that sentence means, right? Well, it turns out maybe it doesn't mean that. Another thing that that sentence could imply is that Alice and Betty literally are in the same dress. So now they've shown up on the prom wearing the same dress and they're tickled pink by their antics rather than being mortified. So when we hear that sentence though, we typically wouldn't think that's what's being described, but rather that there are two different dresses that Alice and Betty have on. Now, Let's consider this sentence. This sentence is as essentially exactly the same as the previous sentence. Alice and Betty ran from the same building. Instead of had on, there's ran from, verb, preposition. And instead of building, it's dress, a noun. But the structure is exactly the same. What does this sentence mean? Well, it might mean that there's one building that Alice ran from. And there's another building that looks just like it that Betty ran from. Okay, or it might mean that there's one building and Alice and Betty ran from it. Now, in this situation, despite the similarity with the previous sentence, we typically wouldn't assume that this is the scenario being described. Instead, there's one building. So why is it that with one sentence, we assume there were two distinct dresses and with another sentence, we assume that there's one building. That's the ambiguity or problem with using a natural language. Okay, another problem with using natural languages to talk to computers is that they often provide quite a bit of redundant information. And this is great for humans because it makes them fault tolerant. In other words, we can misrepresent certain things or miss having some parts of information conveyed to us and yet get the overall meaning of something. And so as an example of this, 
let's consider this sentence. So I'll give you a second to try and read this sentence. And I'll read it for you. It says, it doesn't matter in what order the letters in a word are. The important thing is that the first and last letter are in the right place. And it turns out this was from an internet hoax that went around a little while ago that was claiming this was based on research at Cambridge University. And this statement isn't quite true, but the point is still interesting that if you look at this sentence that 13 of the 27 words are misspelled, but you probably didn't have much trouble reading this. And that's because humans are wonderful at doing pattern recognition, kind of making sense of things that have mistakes within them. But computers are not good about that. So we come up with languages that force us to be very precise in the information that we convey. Okay, computers can't handle ambiguity and they typically, without a lot of programming by us, handle mistakes. So another way of saying this, this is essentially repeating the first sentence, the statements or instructions that we provide to a computer must be unambiguous and without mistakes. So the computer languages provide a framework for enforcing this. And what we try to do is make it so that the grammar of a language is something that a human can decipher and yet it can easily be translated into the ones and zeros that a computer can understand. So how do we use a computer language to talk to the computer? Well, one model of doing this is to create a file known as a source file in which we put statements from a particular language. And in this case, I put a little bit of C code within this box here. That's just our description of what we want the computer to do then we take this source file and we feed it into a bit of software that's known as a compiler and that translates what we can read into something the computer understands, the ones and zeros. So this is known as an executable file. This is something the computer understands and can run, but it, it just sits there after we've compiled or translated the source file to the executable file. It just sits there. But then what we could do is we could take that executable file and we could say, OK, computer, now we want you to run this. So this source or an executable file is fed into the computer processor. And what comes out is the output or results that we were interested in. Another way we can run our code on the computer, we start with a source file again. Here I just wrote a bit of Python code. And instead of feeding that into a compiler, we feed it into a bit of software, a program that's called an interpreter. And what happens is the results, the output is directly generated by the interpreter. So the source code is executed directly from the source file. But this interpreter usually provides another way of interacting with it, and that's we can have an interactive environment. And by that I mean we could just take our keyboard and type some commands and immediately they're fed into the interpreter and we get the output or the results. So we'll use the Python interpreter and compilers are typically better at catching errors in the code because they look at an entire program at once and they could also produce faster executable code. So the Python code will run a little bit slower than a compiled language such as C, but the interpreter is much better for developing code and for learning to use a computer language.